All right, welcome back to Waste Some Time with Jason Green. I am Jason Green, bringing you brand new interviews right here on YouTube. If you uh, want to subscribe, now's the time to do it. And also go to the Patreon link in the, the description below, and you can be asking the next questions of my guests. We've got some good questions today coming directly from uh, Patreon members. So you want to stick around and see that. You'll also get to see these interviews before anybody else. we got a good one today. I say that a lot, but today I mean it. Steve Riley, you know him probably best from LA Guns, but on this day, 36 years ago, Wasp released a record called The Last Command, featured Steve Riley on drums, uh, the first of three records that he would appear on. We're going to talk about that and much more right after this. Please welcome Steve Riley. Jason, how you doing, bro? Good. Thank you so much for joining me. Ah, man, it's good to be with you. Yeah. So we got to start with Wasp. Can you believe Wasp is getting ready to celebrate 40 years, and your involvement is uh, 37 of those years because you joined – Tony Richards played drums on the first album, but you joined and did the touring for that record, right? Yeah, I mean, like, they recorded that album. I was in the studio doing Kill's Right to Rock album at the same time, and that's when I got the call from Blackie. I had just finished my drum tracks and backing vocals on that album, and he asked me if I wanted to go out on tour with Wasp, and that was, a, that was the beginning of a run for four years with Wasp. Yeah. Were you planning on staying in Kiel? Like, were you going to be a member of that band? Yeah, man, things were going good, Jason. I mean, they were signed to A&M Records. Gene Simmons was producing the first album, and uh, things looked really good for Kiel. They had a lot of steam on them. And uh, if the Wasp thing didn't happen, I would have stayed with Kiel. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a tricky situation. And in your career, it's happened a few times where you kind of have to gamble on uh, what's the right – project and that happened like I said that happens a few times later in your career so before we get too deep into wasp you know we teased it a little bit and yes this t we're recording this today on November 9th 36 years ago today the record was released but we want to go back a little further people have had questions about your early career a lot of questions I'm getting uh, uh, from patreon will Grag Gragado and uh, Jean uh, Kulin Kulin I hope we got that right they both want to know about bees. The Bees was a really, really good time for me. They were a band out of Chicago, and uh, I was with them for about two, two and a half years. We got signed to Epic Records. Tom Worman produced the first album. That's how I got connected with Tom Worman to bring him over to do uh, one of the uh, LA Guns albums. And uh, things were going really good. They just didn't have any direction. They didn't have any management. They could help them direct them in the right way. And uh, things eventually fell apart. We did the one album, and uh, that was about it with them. But it was a great experience. I went up to Chicago. We lived out in Lake Geneva, and uh, we wrote a ton of songs. I mean, about three albums worth of material. And it's really where I got my chops down on how to write, too. My, my good friend Tommy Harlan, the lead singer for The Beast, him and I had been in Steppenwolf together, and that's when, why he called me. We had done the Steppenwolf thing, and then he started this band, The Bees, called me up, asked me if I wanted to do it, and uh, I was in. Yeah, and you're talking about your songwriting. Going way ahead to L.A. Guns release Renegades, there is a song co-written by you and Tommy Holland, and we, we got some questions about that. Um, a lot of people were asking if it was a reunion, but I believe it's just an older track that you brought back, right? Yeah, you know, we were sitting on so much material that each one of us wrote. And uh, I had asked Tommy uh, about a couple of years ago, before I had started this uh, thing with Kelly, that if I could move some material, if I could place it, is he interested in doing that? And he was. So, you know, I placed one of the songs on the album. Yeah, which is very cool uh, that, you know, that it saw the light that many years later and a great song at that. Um, uh, Bees appears on American Bandstand with Dick Clark, right? Yeah, we were the only band to appear on American Bandstand that wasn't signed. It was before we got signed, 
And uh, Dick Clark made a point of that when we, he came into our dressing room. He said, you know, I don't usually have bands on that on sign. In fact, he said, I've never had a band on. And mm -hmm. so that's a big distinction that we got to be on an American bandstand. It gave us a little bit of heat. Tom Mormon saw it, and he ended up signing us to Epic. Yeah, it's, it's a, a pretty unique distinction to have in, in that long history of a American bandstand. They obviously thought you guys um, had something. Okay, oh, so we're, we're jumping all around. You got a long, busy career. Uh, uh, let's get back to, to Wasp, though. So you, you join Wasp in 84. Last Command comes out in 85. So you do all the touring. This is the crazy years. These are, these are the PMRC years. These are the, uh, you know, Wasp is really this um, larger than life kind of thing. Totally, bro. And then, you know, 84 was a really good year for me. I did the the Kill album, Right to Rock, and then went right into Wasp. And, uh, and we toured so much. I mean, we toured constantly for that album, the first album. Went all around the world. We did our own dates. We did dates with Kiss. We did dates with Iron Maiden. And... Uh, we came off the road and went directly into the studio to do Last Command. So we were really hot. We were we were playing well and we were gelling well. And uh, it, it was just a really good timing thing to go right off the road, right into the studio, and everybody be just right on, on their toes. Do you know why Tony Richards left after recording the first record? The only thing I know, and I've spoken with Tony it just briefly a couple of times, and... Uh, He's a really great guy and a really great drummer. I think that he had a problem uh, with Blackie, like all of us did. <laughs> you know, I mean, Blackie not only fired Tony Richards, he ended up firing Randy Piper, he fired me, and then he fired Chris. So he fired a lot of really talented people that were contributing to that sound and that whole vibe of Wasp. And uh, I don't know if he's ever captured it again. You know, that first... Wasp that went out on the road in 84 with me, Randy, Chris, and Blackie. We were great, man. I just think we were a great band. We not only sounded great and looked great, we had the material. Everybody was playing great. And I just thought that band had a lot of legs. I thought we could have gone on for a long time. And uh, he slowly disbanded it one guy at a time, starting with Tony Richards, you know, and uh, Tony never got to do any live dates with them. He did some club dates in L.A., and he recorded the album. He shot a couple of the videos for the first album, and then they let him go. And uh, I don't know if that was a mistake. It was fortunate for me. Right. I don't, I don't know if it was a mistake because the guy was a really good drummer. He seems like a really nice guy, and uh, they, they, Blackie let him go. Yeah, it's like you said, Blackie has a history of this. So Wasp is about to embark on a 40th anniversary tour. But to my knowledge, the only person who's been there the whole time is Blackie. It seems like a shame. Uh, we did a show here in Vegas with the band that I put together, Sin City Sinners, where we, we had you and Randy Piper play those Wasp songs together because we were trying to show. And I've had Chris play with Randy before. I've had Johnny Rod that all these guys are out there and playing and wouldn't it be great? And so I'm assuming there has been no talk of anyone getting back together. Well, here's the thing, bro. You know, about, uh, I think, well, if it's the 40th anniversary, it was 10 years ago when, Bla when Randy called me up and said, you know, it's the 30th anniversary of Wasp. We said, uh, would you be interested in doing a run with the original band? And I always have been open to that. I mean, I would make time and room, even with LA Guns, to go and do a run with Wasp. And if it was a one-off run, I'm good with that. But I love that band so much that I would always make room for it. And uh, I told Randy, yeah, of course I'm interested. And then, you know, a little bit of time went by and uh, he called me and I asked him, did you uh, talk to Blackie and Chris about this? And he said he hadn't. And I said, well, you know, there's nothing really there with just me and you saying that we want to do it. You know, those two would want to do have to do it. And uh, those two guys don't get along at all, you know. And uh, they got a bad history together. They did some great material and great work together. But they, they, they're not getting on at all. So that 
30th anniversary of Wasp. It, it was like a, it was an idea. I was into it, and uh, it, it came and went really fast. Yeah, um, there are a lot of personalities involved, and so I, I think Blackie feels like you know what I've gone on this long by myself. It seems like he's playing mostly international dates, and I think he's going to run it out in his way. But Wasp fans are passionate. There's a lot of bands that have passionate fans, but Wasp fans are serious about their band. They love it. Every time I've had one of those members do something, people went crazy. They, they really, you know, I, like I say, people know you from LA Guns, but boy, those Wasp fans want to hear those songs. And so it's a shame that it didn't, uh, that, that it, there wasn't some reunion. And who knows, maybe the pressure will get to Blackie at some point to realize, boy, the fans would sure love to see this one more time. Well, you know what, Jason? I read something that uh, about this 40th anniversary run, and uh, the musicians he's got playing with them—they're really good musicians. They're really good guys too. But the thing is, is that uh, he's going to be doing the blood and the, the throwing the meat out and everything that we did when we did the Lyceum show, and uh, we had done that everywhere, all over the world, except Blackie wanted to drop it when we got back to North America. I don't know why. We should have done it here too. But if you really want to do that, if you really want to revisit Wasp on a 40th anniversary, it's got to be with Chris, Randy, and me. It's got to be. It's got to be the four of us together. The four, the three of us are still playing really well. Chris and Randy play all the time. It's just that Blackie doesn't want to do it. And I feel. As, a, as one of the original members, I feel like it's something that if you do want to do a 40th anniversary tour, even if you want to go out, even if I want to stay with LA Guns, that's fine. But put together a nice 20 to 30 date run where we can do the festivals, where we can go over to Europe, we can go to Japan, and really make something out of an anniversary tour with the four original guys. And uh, he just has doesn't want anything to do with that, and I think that cuts it short of being a real anniversary tour. But you know, that's just the way I feel. Yeah, well, I think a lot of people feel that way, and it's a shame because, like you said, everyone's alive and still playing. There, there's no reason not to do it. I know that LA Guns played a show with Wasp a bunch of years back. Did you actually get to talk to Blackie? Yes, I did. And that was the first time I had seen him, and man, I, I got to tell you, probably like about 20, 25 years, and. Uh, we get along fine. There wasn't a really bad break. He just let me go. There wasn't like a big fight or anything like that. But um, we hugged and it was good seeing him. And LA Guns ended up doing, I believe it was between seven and 10 shows with Wasp in the States here. They didn't go that well. I don't know why, because it was a really good bill, but it fizzled out and I did get to see Black and it was really cool to see him after all that time. Yeah, and so you make an interesting point. You, you you say that Blackie let you go. A lot of places report that you left Wasp to go to L.A. Guns, and obviously that's not correct. Not at all. You know, I was ready to move on and go for it. We had just done the Electric Circus tour, and we recorded that tour for Live in the Raw. Mm -hmm. So I, we, my last date with LA, with the Wasp, I'm sorry, was uh, headlining Long Beach Arena, and it was – a great show, tons of people. I mean, it was huge, and uh, I was ready to move on. Even though I gotta say, when he fired Randy Piper, it changed the dynamics of that band so much. Jason, it wasn't even funny. That guy was not only the twin guitar lead guitar player playing off of Chris. Randy sounding a lot like Billy Gibbons, and Chris sounding a lot like an Eddie Van Halen type. So it was the perfect mixture of two different types of lead guitars. And on the albums, on the tours, those two guys playing off each other was terrific. And then you get Randy being the second vocal, all of those harmonies. I did the third harmony, but that second harmony that you hear all through Wasp on those first couple of albums, that's Randy Viper. And he is a terrific singer, and not only a terrific guitar player, but a terrific singer. So you get rid of him, then you, Blackie picks up the guitar and gets a bass player. It was Johnny Rod, who was a great guy and a good, really good bass player. It changed the dynamic to that band, man. You, you, you're missing that second lead. 
and uh, it just changed everything. We did Electric Circus. I really like that album. I think it turned out well. And uh, we did the Live in the Rock thing. But um, boy, did I miss Randy. And I think the fans missed him too. Yeah, that's a big moment in Wasp history when Blackie decides he's not playing bass anymore. And they make that change. And it does, um, either, there's still some good music, but it is not that core thing. So he gives you no reason for terminating you? He just said, you know, his thing, his reasoning when he let me go was he was going to go solo. He didn't say he was going to go on with Wasp. He just said he was going to go solo. And I was still really disappointed when he called me and told me that. And uh, I just, you know, it, where are you going to go with it? It was his band. It's his baby. But even though all of us contributed and we had a really good chemistry, the four of us, it was his call on just about everything and anything with Wasp, like it is right now. So when yeah. he called me, I was totally disappointed, man, because I loved being in Wasp. I thought the band was great. Even with the change with Randy, I thought we still had a lot going on with me, Blackie, and Chris, and, and Johnny joining us. But um, I was totally disappointed. I had no idea what I was going to do. I knew I was going to do something else, but I had no idea what I was going to do. So I was kind of a little bit in limbo for a couple of months there. Really disappointed that I was not in Wasp anymore, too. Yeah, I, I, can, uh, I can imagine. And you know, so just some of your contributions to Wasp, also the song uh, Jack Action, which is on uh, uh, the uh, Last Command, when we're talking about, that's a song you co-wrote. How does that come about? You know what? That is one from The Beast, too. That's a song from The Beast. I had written a bunch of songs in The Beast up in Lake Geneva, and uh, that was one of them. Blackie was writing material for Last Command. He said, do you have anything you want to bring in? And I brought Jack Action, and it was a finished song, and then he added a bridge to it. Not much more. It was just the middle section bridge to it, and uh, that's why there's a co-writer on it, but that song had been written in 19, I don't know, 80, 81. I, and then a couple of other songs from that session work I did up in Lake Geneva uh, got put on LA Guns. So, so I, I've ended up using a bunch of that material I did with the Bees. Yeah, it's it survived. And is there? It, can anyone find that Bees music anywhere, by the way? And can they find what? Can you find the Bees music? Like you know what? We did, we did the one album, Get Up, on Epic Records, and uh, everything else is all in demo form, and I mean tons of it. We wrote and wrote and wrote. We were up on the lake up there. It was a great house, and we had a studio that we built inside the house, and uh, we just kept writing and writing and writing, and that's where, I tell you, I learned a lot of stuff from Tommy Holland and the other guys about writing and about about structure and about phrasing and everything. And uh, we just were writing fools up there. We were writing and writing and writing for that second Bees album on Epic that never got to be made. And uh, so we ended up doing Dick Clock, the Get Up record for Epic. And then that was about it. We wrote a ton of other songs. But it, it's not in print anywhere though, right? No, I, I believe I'm the only one who really kept everything. I don't know if like Mike DeFoyer and Tony, the keyboard player, or, or even Tommy Holland, the singer, kept everything that we did. So I had it on cassette, and then I spent about a, a month and a half with all these machines on my desk, switching all of my cassette stuff over to CD, and then putting on my computer so I could really refer back to it. And it's helped me too, because I placed a lot of songs. Yeah, I, I think it'd be an uh, uh, interesting release for people because it has this history throughout your career. Because I was on YouTube trying to find it, and I think people love to find these lost bands. Oh, man, there's so much good material. That Bees band should have done a lot more than one album. There was so much talent in the band, and there was so much great songwriting. I got, I got like about... I don't know about between 40 and 50 songs that the five of us had written and separately and together. And uh, it's just so much good material. I placed a couple with LA Guns. I'm about to place, place another one on the new album that we're working on right now. And, uh, you know, I keep referring back to it because it was just a great period in my life of songwriting. Yeah, it's a, 
I'm not sure it was the best name. B apostrophe Z Z. It doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Terrible. Terrible. You know where it comes from? The band that the bass player, guitar player, and the uh, uh, keyboard player from the Bees, they were in a band called The Boys from Illinois. And it was called B-O-Y-Z-Z. -Z. Easy to pronounce. Very easy. The Boys from Illinois. They made a little bit of, it had a little bit of heat in the, in the Midwest and they did an album. And then these three guys went on to start The Bees with Tommy. When they told me that the name of the band was The Bees, I knew right off the bat that it was going to be hard for people to pronounce it. And when our video for Get Up, Get Angry was on uh, early MTV, uh, 81, 82, whatever, they, uh, uh, Martha, the, the, the VJ, she mispronounced it. And I knew it. It was just like a drag, too, because there you go. Our video is finally on TV, and they mispronounced the name. But it's an easy one to mispronounce. I, I mean, the spelling is just... Uh, it's confusing. So I knew as soon as they said it was the B's and it wasn't spelled B-E-E-S and it was B apostrophe Z Z, that that was going to get screwed up at some point. Yeah, not many apostrophes in rock and roll. No, not, not good. Not, not their work. So, okay, so we're talk, we were talking about Wasp and we're talking about uh, Blackie letting you go and that coming to an end and a little time is going to go by before you find out what's next. At this point, LA Guns is already recording their debut album. The drummer at that time is Nicky B. Alexander, who is a punk drummer. He comes from the LA punk scene. He, he's not, he's not um, in that Guns N' Roses sort of metal scene. He really comes from, you know, uh, the Black Flag West Coast punk scene. So, um, so tell me how you find out about LA Guns. Okay, you know, I was doing the Live in the Raw tour. Actually, it was the Electric Circus tour. And we recorded Live in the Raw for it. While I was doing that, and while all of us, because, you know, I'm kind of fortunate. I was mixed up with both waves of metal out of L.A. There was the first wave with Motley, Wasp, Rat, Dawkins, and all of those bands, Great White, all of them. That was that first wave of metal. Second wave was Guns N' Roses, LA Guns, Faster Pussycat, and all of those guys. And so I was really fortunate to get into both waves big time. But while I was doing that tour, and while all of us, all those bands I just mentioned from the first wave, we were on the road so much touring from 83 to 87, we didn't know that there was this new wave coming out of LA. We were not home enough to even check it out and see. We were always either in the studio or on the road, pretty much on the road, all of those bands. And um, I didn't even know about it. This Guns N' Roses, LA Guns, Faster Pussycat thing, I had no idea what was going on in LA. And uh, I uh, got out of Wasp, and because I was living in an apartment, I wasn't able to play the drums there, so I rented a small room at SIR on Santa Monica here just to play and just keep my drums over there. And I was over there just tooling around on my drums, and in comes Tracy. And I had met Tracy at the Whiskey and a couple of other clubs, maybe the Starwood. He was just a young kid that had come up to me and said, uh, Hey, I'm a real big fan of Wasp, man, and da 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 da. And you know, and we got to talking a little bit, and but that was it. And so I had met him a couple of times. He came in the room. He heard me rehearsing. I think I was playing something like Love Machine on a double kick, and she said, "Just to stay loose." And uh, he came in and said, "Hey, what's up, man?" And I was like, I recognized him immediately that I see run into this kid in the clubs, and. Uh, I still didn't really know his name or anything. I didn't know him that well. And he said, um, he, he wanted to know, you're not in Wasp anymore, huh? And I said, no, I'm out. And he said, uh, we just finished our album. He said, and we're going to let our drummer go. And uh, I was like, wow. It was the same situation as the Tony Richards thing. They just finished their album. Good album. It's just like Wasp with the first album. And they let their drummer go. I don't know why because the album turned out great. And uh, he said, we're going to let our drummer go. 
uh, are you interested? I said, well, you know, you got something to listen to. And he pulled out this cassette and it was like a homemade cassette, you know, with writing on it and shit. And, uh, and it wasn't even there. Their album hadn't been even packaged yet. That's why I'm on the first cover, or the photo of the first cover. It wasn't even packaged yet. So he hands me this cassette and says, you know, just go home and take a listen to it and see what you think. And I took it home and I listened to this first LA Guns album and I was like, wow, this is really good stuff, man. Really good songwriting and the, the players are good and uh, everything's right there. They're signed to a major label and uh, it seems like a really good deal. They were still playing clubs in LA, so they hadn't even packaged their first album yet. So I had uh, gone down to SIR again and pulled my drums in their room and we played and they loved it and I thought it was great too. And so I, I was asked to join and um, I ended up joining. I, I had ended up finding out about this whole new wave too that was going on with Guns N' Roses. Guns N' Roses album wasn't even packaged yet. And uh, it was Faster and, and, and Jet Boy and all these bands. And I was uh, like blown away that this whole new scene was happening and all these bands were getting signed. Um, and so I ended up joining LA Guns right then and starting to rehearse with them in SIR. And our first show was the Country Club out in Reseda. So I had gone from headlining Long Beach Arena to the Country Club with LA Guns, I headlining with uh, Wasp in, uh, in, uh, at Long Beach and then going to the Country Club. So it was a real gamble too, because I didn't know what was going to happen. I knew the album sounded really, really good, but who knows what was going to happen at that point. See, when I joined Wasp, the steam on Wasp was unbelievable. They were already on the covers of magazines, and I had seen them. I'd even gone to see them at the Reseda uh, Country Club when Tony was playing with them, just because I had seen so much written about them. And I was like, who is this man? What's going on with them? And I saw them at the Country Club, and so they had a whole bunch of shit going on for them. They were signed to the management with uh, Iron Maiden, and they were Capitol Records, and they had this big machine built. When I joined LA Guns, it was a much smaller thing and it contained and uh, they had a small management and, uh, you know, small business manager, just small everything. The agency was a local agency, not a national agency. And so it was a gamble joining, but I felt like the material in the band was so good. I got to take a shot at it and just see what happens. And uh, unfortunately, you know, we did some clubs in LA and then boom, we were out, the album got released. We shot the cover and people asked me, you know, why are you on the cover? Because I was recording the Live in the Raw album at the same time. And so uh, I got on the cover because it wasn't even packaged yet. So I, I joined the band, they shot the cover and uh, we went out on tour. We did a club tour and then joined, uh, hooked up with some uh, bigger acts and fortunately things took off. But it was a, it was a gamble because they were a club band here in LA with a very small machine around them, but the material was so strong, Jason, that I said, man, I want to take a shot at this. It's take really good. Yeah. yeah that, the packaging that you're referring to, that, that was very common at the time. You want people to be familiar with the band that you're going to put out there. And so that people pick it up and they look at it. It was different. You didn't go on Wikipedia back then. You got a right. record, that's the band, and, and that's what you're trying to establish. So it's not like you're trying to mislead people. You're just trying to put out um, the band that you're going to promote. So oh. LA Guns goes on to have uh, a long and crazy history. You know, you probably got 600 members over the years and, and oh. different lineups. And you could never have imagined when you were jamming an SAR what this LA Guns was going to happen to your life and uh, career and, and everything else. So I'm going to give the, the abridged version so that I don't keep you all day. But... Um, and because LA Guns has got quite the uh, quite the history, but you do the first three albums that people love: self-titled, uploaded Hollywood Vampires. Things are going big. You guys go on tour. I saw you at Madison Square Garden with ACDC. I mean, big things, big things happening. 
you guys were up for the Motley Crue Dr. Feel Good Tour. I don't know if you tell that story, why it didn't happen, but uh, there well, was- Well, I tell you what, that was one of the most disappointing things because I had, when I left WASP, I have learned so much about how to be an integral part of the band and, and be a liaison between the band and management. And uh, I had taken on that role with LA Guns. As soon as I joined, obviously I was a senior member. I was older than those guys. I had done a bunch of stuff before then. And uh, they asked me, and right as soon as I joined, would you want to be the guy that makes things happen and is the connection between the record company and the management and the band. And I was like, if you guys want me to do it, and the four of them wanted me to do it. So I had done that right from the beginning at their request. They wanted me to do it. It wasn't like, hey, I know everything and I'm going to do it. They asked me to do it. And so I, I took on that role right away as soon as I joined. And I was very uh, involved in letting them know the kind of machine that I came from in Wasp is needed in LA Guns. So we were going to have to clean house. And they were kind of taken back from that because they were connected to all these smaller people that had been working with them. I told them, we have to get bigger management, a bigger agency, a better business manager. We have to really clean the slate right now. And, uh, and, and if we want to take it to the next level, and uh, this is during that first album's tour, and uh, it's, it's kind of hard to do, but you have to do it, Jason. You have to make a bold move like that. Otherwise, you can get stuck. And I know many bands, including the Bees and some other bands that stayed with their small management. And that is a really big mistake. You have to cut the ties and the friendship. This is a business and you have to make a bold move if you want to join another rank and go and step up. And so I told them I could find the management. I can find the agency. I found Bill Elson with ICM and I found Alan Kovac, who's now managing Motley. Mm -hmm. And he had just been managing Richard Marks at the time. But when I saw him, I, I interviewed a ton of managers. When we got off that first tour, I just went around town, Shep Gordon, all of them. I talked, I went to their offices and talked to everybody. And Alan Kovac at the time was smaller than a bunch of the managers that I had talked to, but he had a plan for radio. He had already been involved with radio with Richard Marx. So he had this plan on how to get LA Guns on the radio. And that was impressive to me because that was really a big step. How do we get this band heard? Because that first album was not heard a lot because the management did not really know how to work it. So I kind of like, you know, told the band we had a clean house and we built the whole machine, rebuilt it. And uh, like I said, with Bill Allison at ICM and Alan Kovac and a new business manager, Burt Padel in New York, these are big, big names. And uh, they, they, they started working with us and they helped pull it all together. And we ended up, ended up having a really good four years after that until, you know, the uh, end of uh, the middle of the Hollywood Vampire Tour when they fired me. <laughs> well, I want to put that, so I'm going to point out that Dr. Feelgood story that, I, that I'm alluding oh, yeah. to. I'm sorry, that right there. We had just finished Cocked and Loaded. And uh, I'm sorry, we were in, uh, we had just finished Hollywood Vampire. Mm -hmm. And Motley, at the time, they really liked us. Nikki liked us. And, and everybody in the band, they really dug LA Guns. They thought we were a really good band. They were going to give us the entire world Dr. Feelgood tour, going over in Europe, through Asia and Scandinavia, back to North America. I mean, the whole bill, the whole thing. They were going to take LA Guns. And then one of the guys in the band, I'm not even going to mention him, one of the guys in the band screwed up. I think Vince and his wife, Cherise, were separated at the time or going through a rough time. And one of the guys in the band saw Cherise and that 
screwed up everything. I will never get it out of my mind being in Alan Kovacs office on sunset. And Alan said, we got a big problem. Because we were already like, yeah, we got the Dr. Feelgood tour. Mm -hmm. This was going to make Hollywood vampires not gold or platinum. It was going to make us double platinum if we did that tour. And we were so into it. We were geared for this tour. And uh, Kovac said to me, we got a problem, Steve. And I sat down in his office and he told me, he said, uh, I think we lost the tour. And I was like, what the hell happened? And he said, yeah, what went on with so-and-so and Charisse? And I was like, oh, man. Because I knew it was happening, but I didn't realize the ramifications from it. I didn't realize what was going to happen. And uh, Vince found out about it and totally said, I am not going to take that band out on this tour. And like, I can't get that out of my mind, sitting in Alan Kovac's office that whole afternoon and saying, we just lost this tour. We lost a, an insane tour, a world tour, not even just a North America day, it's the entire thing. And it ended up being Motley's biggest album, so that in turn would have turned Hollywood vampires into like double platinum. Easy. Well, and it opened a big door for Faster Pussycat, because that's who stepped into that, at least they did the US tour. That's correct. And, you know, we had to go into a mode because we had Hollywood vampires coming out and we had to support it, but we had very little time. So we went from doing, and this is nothing against these bands, but we were in a damage mode. And uh, we went from having the whole Motley World Tour, which was diamond, we couldn't believe how good it was, to having a piece of our own tour together. And we took out... Dangerous Toys and Tora Tora. Two really good bands, two really good young bands, and they had a lot of steam on them. But, you know, if you weigh one against the other, the Martin World Tour against us headlining theaters and large clubs, it just doesn't, it's not going to, it's off. And so, yeah, like I said, it's nothing against Dangerous Toys and Tora Tora. I, I really dig those guys, and I dig their music. But we, we had to go into damage control and find out how are we going to support Hollywood vampires. But we lost that tour over a silly thing because at that point, we could have gotten any chick in the world at that point. Yeah. Why this? Why this? Why go that route? And it backfired that much, but it did. So it, it, I think that Ellie Guns also would have been a great fit with Molly. And I think young people oh. would have dug the vampire image and that sleazy kind of thing. And yeah, it, it, it could have been a big opportunity. But uh, we can't cry over spilled milk because we got other things to get to. Uh, Hollywood vampires, after that, as you said, you get fired. There's some story I barely remember. My Ellie Guns history is pretty good, but is there something that you rolled up a newspaper and hit Phil Lewis with it? You know what? That story became such a big thing. Like now it's like I assaulted him. And, right. and if I assaulted him, I'll tell you, any drama punches somebody in the face, they're going to feel it and they're going to be all fucked up. They're going to be hurt. I didn't assault him and I didn't even hit him with a paper. I had a, my newspaper rolled up. It was something like, you know, we had to do a date on July 4th and drive from so-and-so to so-and-so, and it was too far to drive without getting there and going right on stage. And everybody was having a good time, and I believe it was Cleveland, and we had to drive to upstate New York or some shit. And again, I was working with the tour manager because I'm the liaison from the band. And uh, he said, I think we gotta go tonight. And uh, I said, well, you know, if you think we have to go, we just gotta do it. And everybody had been having really good time on that off day on July 4th in Cleveland. They were out on boats and having fun and everything. And so we had to pull a plug on that and get everybody on the bus and get them going. And so that turned into a big argument and uh, Phil was really pissed off about it. And uh, we were eating breakfast that next morning in the next venue and, uh, and he said something to me and I just got up and I tapped him on the top of the head. And I see he said, you know, F you. And I said, I walked away. I just tapped him. On the top of the head, and it turned into this big, big scene that that's why I got fired. I don't even think that was the reason why. I think it was pretty much because I had to take on this role of pretty much telling the band, we got to do this, we got to do that. And 
a few of them didn't understand that, that I'm not giving them orders. I'm just telling them, this is what we got to do to make this happen or that happen. And so I think that came to a head and, it, you know, Phil didn't want to play with me anymore. After that show, after that devil, that whole scene and from Cleveland to the next thing, and then just it built up. And he told Trace that he didn't want to play with me anymore. I told the guys, this is going to be the biggest mistake you made. You guys are going to last for about six months. Nobody's going to want to do what I'm doing. And you're going to end up splintering. And it's exactly what happened with them. They did the Vicious Circle album without any of them being in the studio together, which I wouldn't have let happen. I mean, you've got to be in the studio together recording. You can't fly in your parts. And uh, they ended up disbanding. You know, Tracy doing Killing Machine and Phil doing his thing. And LA Guns, they, they, it just kind of wilted away for like about three years until, you know, they wanted to get the original guys back together and asked me to come back. And then we did, you know, the, I had a tour in 95, but it was a mistake. We were on a roll and the band had a lot of legs to it. And to just start disbanding it, it was, it was a bad move. Yeah. And so here's where it begins getting interesting. There's always different lineups, at the, but the common denominator seems to be you. You, you. It's you and Tracy first, and Kelly Nichols is also still around. I'm talking about the American Hardcore, which, no offense, Steve, I still don't get that record. It's the one record that I sit down and I go, you know what? Maybe I was wrong. Maybe I missed something. Maybe it's good now, and it's not. But my opinion. Uh, but you guys are trying to step it up, I think. Just to touch on that thing with American Hardcore, because we did many albums. I did many with Tracy alone and then with Phil alone. And uh, American Hardcore was something we entered into, me and Tracy. The original three other guys left. And uh, Tracy and I said, let's move on. Let's keep going. We, we we got this great catalog of material, and we can get a good singer, and let's let's move on. And Tracy, at that time, I think I've told the story a bunch of times, but he was really into Pantera and real, real hardcore shit. And uh, he wanted to do an album like that. He wanted it to purposely be a total departure from L.A. Gun Sound, which is not good. If you establish a sound and you establish a fan base that likes that sound, you got to stay true to it, man. You got you can't just depart like we did on American Hardcore. It was such a departure too, man. No, you didn't miss anything. That album is what it is. It's a total departure from anything LA Guns. Yeah, it's it's now it's called the LA Guns for that record. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> it's uh, you go do some dates with Udo, you know, from Accept and but very small venues, and this is a time before that resurgence happens, where these hard rock bands are going to jump on Poison Tours and it's going to be fun again. This right. is the, the lean years. At this time, you and Tracy are partners in it. Kelly Nichols did write songs on that record. So he was involved for a while. I think when the Polygram or it wasn't a major label, he was out. Is that right? That's right, because Mick Cripps and Phil Lewis had left completely. And Kelly was hanging with me and Tracy and wanted to check this out and, and see what we could do. We even looked at new names for bands. And so we realized, no, we worked so hard to establish the LA Guns. Why call it something different right now? But um, uh, Kelly was with us in the pre-production mode of that American Hardcore thing, which is why he's a writer on some of the songs. And, uh, and it, 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 what, during that pre-production is when he ended up leaving also. Right. And so at this time, you guys are trying to protect that L.A. Guns brand. You and Tracy filed a joint to own the mark and the Shield logo, and you guys become partners in business. And th this will come up again, again, obviously, later. But so you guys do that. American Hardcore doesn't work. You try to go back to a little bit more of the L.A. Guns sound, the EP Wasted, which features Ralph from uh, uh, Steel Panther now, uh, you know, I, I Michael Starr or whatever the hell his name is. But uh, – if that that's like if if David Lee Roth sang for L.A. Guns, because uh, at the time he was in a you know a Van Halen cover band, and it's a fun little EP, um, and I think maybe people were happy to see you guys kind of go back to the direction that they were used to. Yeah, you know, and it was a, it was a semi going back because Ralph again is a great singer and a great guy. I really love the guy, and uh, it was fun working with him. And uh, he is. Uh, 
He did this six song EP with us. He had been a friend of us while he was doing the Van Halen cover band, uh, Atomic Punk. Mm-hmm. And uh, Atomic Punk's and uh, he was a friend of Tracy's and then introduced to me and we got along really well. So when we were looking for a singer after Chris Van Dahl did the American Hardcore thing with us, we realized that, that it, it wasn't working. Me and Trace both realized that didn't work. And so we would try semi to get back to the sound. But again, like you said, it, it was like I, I almost rock joining the band. And it was a, it was still a different sound. But I really liked the stuff on Wasted that I did with Ralph. I thought it was great. And I thought it was a great little EP and produced really well. And uh, Ralph ended up touring with us on that. And then he told us he was going to leave too. And he was going to go back do Atomic Punks, it was before this Steel Panther thing, and uh, he was going to do Atomic Punks, and um, it was a very amicable thing. We we love him, and I still love Ralph, and uh, he ended up leaving. Jizzy Pearl was rehearsing right across the room, right across the hall from us at this rehearsal studio in North Hollywood, and we've known Jizzy for years, and uh, we ended up talking with him and, he, and asking him, does he want to check this out and do this with me and Tracy. And we ended up doing an album with Jizzy Pearl too. Yeah, Shrinking Violet, which I enjoy that album. It's different than LA Guns. Obviously, anytime you have a different singer, you have a different product, but I think there's some good stuff on there. And then begins this resurgence of that rock scene because Poison uh, gets it back together and VH1 is doing the behind the music and you guys go out and it's a great bill. It's you you guys with Jizzy and then you have uh, Great White, Rat, and poison and a lot of eyes on you and people are starting to think this music is fun songs like never enough are so huge now but when they came out it was popular and it was on you know, headbangers ball and dial mtv and we liked it if we were fans but young people are just it, you would think that song was a big giant single giant single the yeah. response it gets now obviously totally man you know a lot of our materials like that too with this resurgence of young people finding it and finding about the 80s weren't just all, uh, you know, dressing up and being in videos. There was so much good material that came out of the 80s. And young people are finding that right now. And uh, Never Enough is one of those songs. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it's nothing against Jizzy Pro too, because he's such a great guy and a really great singer and a good friend still. But I really wish that we could have gotten the original band back together to do that Poison tour, that Poison Rat tour in, I believe it was 2000. And- uh, 99, I think. 99, 99, yeah, going right into, yeah, it was 99, right. And uh, I really uh, wish we could have gotten the original band back together, Jason, because it would have been a great starting point for us to be back together doing that type of big, tour and uh, it, it was something that, you know, one of those things I wish happened. Yeah, it would have been a great reintroduction because on that bill, um, Great White had as close to the original lineup as possible, Rat had as close at the time for them, right. and then Poison had original, so it would have been great. But 2000, you guys, actually late 99, you guys do get the, the original lineup back together. Um, all five original members, it's exciting. Um, and at the time, it was a little different for bands to get back together. Uh, and this carries on to 2000. That original lineup, it, it doesn't last. Obviously, Kelly and Mick have different lives at this point. And, yeah. you know, I always say it's a different world when you go back on the road. The days of getting on the tour bus and, you know, uh, and playing the, the arena is changed. Now you're getting in the van and you're playing a bowling alley or a pizza place or a, a laundromat. You know, uh, these are all real places. Uh, and so I think maybe they weren't, uh, they weren't up for it. But LA Guns continues. Phil's back. You, Phil, and Tracy are, are continuing. Some great records, Man in the Moon, um, which I really enjoy. I think a great record. Lots of songs that feel, you know, feel like they should be hits. And then uh, after that, let me make sure I get the title right. Awaken the Dead is next, right? Is Waking the Dead next? Yes. Waken the Dead, really heavy. Tracy's playing is great. Um, and uh, again, another record that you listen to and you go, this probably should have been hits. And I think a lot of LA Guns fans 
you know, because there's new fans. It's crazy. We were talking about younger people who may have missed those records. Uh, they're very good records. Absolutely. And, you know, we got an offer, uh, me and Tracy, from Cleopatra Records and Brian over there. He had called us and said, can you get the original guys back together to do a greatest hits album and re-record some of the songs that were videos and singles and maybe write about four or five new tracks? And we got in touch with Phil and Mick and Kelly, and they were interested. They said, yeah, let's do this. So that was the first thing that we did. We went into a studio here in L.A., and uh, we re-recorded about, I believe, about seven or eight of the older tracks. And then we wrote together about four new tracks, four or five new tracks. And that was the Black Beauties album for Cleopatra. So that was the beginning of the original guys getting back together. And uh, we had toured behind that, but you're right. Time has, time has gone by now. And if you haven't been on the road, and believe me, if you don't want to be on the road, it's the worst place to be. It's the worst place to be out on the road and not wanting to be out there. Whether you're doing a tour bus, because we were in buses at that time too. Whether you're doing a tour bus or flying in and grabbing a van and doing a few shows in a 300 mile radius, if you don't want to be out there, you're screwed, you're, you're miserable. And so when we did that tour, you know, that was when Mick and Kelly realized that they didn't want to do it anymore. And, you know, I love those guys. And, and it was like, okay, totally get it. I totally understand it. And uh, they ended up leaving. And that's when me and Mick, I mean, me, Phil and Tracy ended up going on and we did that Man in the Moon album. And then uh, we signed a bunch of different deals with over those next five years with uh, independent labels. And uh, we that was also, we did the Man in the Moon album and then the Wake of the Dead album, which I think is amazing. I like Man in the Moon a lot. I think there's a, a lot of great material on that. But when we did Wake of the Dead with Andy Johns, it was the first of four albums with Andy Johns who we had always wanted to work with. And uh, man, oh man, I'm telling you, I think that Waking the Dead was done so well. And, it, and if it had been released in the 80s, I think that thing would have went through the roof. Yes. But uh, yeah, and we did a bunch of, we did a, a bunch of albums together, up, uh, you know, and uh, we had done uh, Waking the Dead first. And uh, Waking the Dead was about to be released. And we're on the same label as Alice Cooper. So Alice Cooper, and this is like revisiting another nightmare. This Alice Cooper offers us the world tour, starting over in Russia and going to Europe and da 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 da, and taking us back to you the North America. And we were just stoked. And we're out on uh, tour, and uh, Tracy came in the back of the bus. I remember vividly, and told me and Phil he's going to be taking some time off. And we were like, wait a minute, we got this Cooper tour coming up. He said, no, I'm gonna do this thing with Nikki from Motley, I'm gonna do this uh, Brides of Destruction. And right away I said, well, Trace, you could do both. You could do LA Guns and Brides. And you and Nikki, just like he's doing Motley and Brides, you can tailor it around doing both bands. And it can only help both bands to do both of them. And uh, I remember telling him that, and he was like, no, no, I can't do it. We were like, oh, man, this is going to hurt. Can we keep it under wraps so we can get this Cooper tour, get somebody in to replace you? And that was a bad move, too, because that backfired. They found out. Their management found out. And uh, it just looked cheesy, us trying to keep it under wraps. And uh, But, yeah, we ended up losing that Cooper tour just like we lost the Vince Neil to much earlier. And that was a big blow because that could have helped us big time. We not only would have had an amazing album with Waking the Dead, we had the world tour with Alice Cooper, just like Hollywood Vampires and Motley Crue. It was identical. And, uh, and we lost that tour and it sucked big. It was horrible. And we had to go into damage mode and piece a tour together of theaters and maybe mostly large clubs. And uh, 
she, Tracy ended up leaving and uh, not on good terms with me and Phil either. I remember this time very well. You're playing in Vegas with Dokken and a bunch of other bands on a package. And I'm friendly with Tracy and I'm on the bus and Tracy's playing us the bride's music. And you and Phil come on the bus and go to the back. There was no conversation. And that's when Tracy kind of told us that the friendship is separated. That, that uh, You could see how strained things were. We're going to get through these final shows, but you guys know he's leaving. Yes, he has an opportunity. Uh, it would have been nice if he could have juggled those opportunities, as you said. But you're also thinking, we built, we, we, we built this brand and we got an opportunity, which are hard to get. And now we're, we're, we're back down again. Oh, totally, man. Like you said, opportunities at that point in our, right up till today, they're hard to get. You know, it's not the 80s. It's not when you have radio and TV and all this shit working for you. You have, uh, and big machines around you, you have to take opportunities when they come. And that was another opportunity late in our career that was steering us right in the face and we watched it go down the drain. And I didn't think it necessarily had to go down the drain. I really believe he could have done both. He could have done both things and, cause Vice didn't go right into the studio, or right out on tour. They could have done, he could have done both of them. But he chose to just do rides and take some time off. And me and Phil were like, what are you fucking talking about? Take time off. This is what we do. And this is how we make a living. And this is what we do constantly, 24-7. So we ended up moving forward and getting uh, uh, Stacy Blades, I believe. I believe it was actually Stacy was after a couple of other yeah, guys. Have, so so let's, let's give a little strange LA Guns trivia at this point. Brent Muscat from Faster Pussycat is playing at times and at he, a couple of shows where he has to play lead. And at that time, Brent wasn't much of a lead player here in Vegas. He's developed that playing covers, but he sort of had to step up. And LA Guns music is different than Faster Pussycat music. He did the best he could. Then you bring in Chris Holmes from Wasp. So we're going back full circle. Most people do not know that this ever happened. Chris yeah. Holmes was probably... A great player, but not the guy for uh, uh, Elliot Guns. There's stories about him playing uh, Ballad of Jane. You know, oh, no, totally well. yeah, headbanging during Ballad of Jane, going crazy on the stage. It was just all out of sync. And I love Chris to death, and he's, he's such a good friend. And uh, and uh, I don't see him or talk to him that much because we're both doing different things. And he's over yeah, in Europe. Yeah, he's over in Europe now too. And uh, so. Uh, we actually got Brent Muscat and Kerry Kelly. Mm -hmm. And Kerry Kelly, those were two guys we took out. Brent ended up leaving, and then Kerry ended up having some other office to do that he's always working. Yeah. And uh, we ended up getting Frankie. Uh, I forget Frankie's last name. Is it Frankie Will? Was with Will's Arcade, right? Arcade, huh? He's in Piercy's band, right? Yeah, he was with Arcade with Piercy, right? Yeah, I think and, it's Willsley. Yeah, Frank Willsley and. Uh, he, would, he ended up doing a few shows with us, and that, that didn't work out. And then um, that's when we got Stacy Blade. Oh, no, I'm sorry, no. After Frank, that's when we had dates. And we had some dates up in Alaska, and we couldn't pull out of them. Really. There were good dates and good money and just good opportunity to break open that state. And um, they were up in the Northwest, too, I believe Portland and Seattle. And um, I sat down with Phil one day, and I said, uh, do you think I should call Chris? And he was like, yes, call Chris. Because he liked Wasp too a lot. And uh, I said, I'm going to call him. And I called Chris. Chris wasn't really doing anything. And we had him come down. And it was just great seeing him, great playing with him. And, uh, but it was definitely a mismatch. You know, Chris is totally heavy all the time, all the time across the board. He's heavy. And, uh, there's some texture to LA Guns, you know? Yeah, it's a kind of band. Yeah, totally. And so uh, he ended up doing a bunch of shows with us. They were a blast and we had a lot of fun. But then he ended up moving on to do something solo-wise he was going to do. And uh, that's when we found uh, uh, Stacy Blades. Right. Now, I got to say, no disrespect to Stacy Blades, but you got to think to yourselves, we're going to have a band, LA Guns, and we're going to replace a guy named Tracy Guns with a guy named Stacy Blades. Holy shit. You know? oh, I'm telling you, because everything about him is great. 
Yeah, I love his guitar playing. I love his uh, his whole attitude, his look. Everything with Stacy was great. But I thought that immediately too. Stacy Blades, Tracy Guns, the whole thing was just like, oh man, we're gonna hear shit about this. And uh, we did not much, but on the internet we heard some stuff about it. But uh, yeah, I, I I was telling somebody the other day. I'm so glad I never changed my name. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad. Yeah. That's how I was born with Steve Riley. I just kept it. Yeah, it's uh, sometimes I think people regret those changes that they're stuck with. I oh. think he did because he calls himself something else now. But oh, uh, does he? Oh, I, I think he added another name, you know, uh, I don't know. But uh, he probably should have done it 20 years earlier. But um, so, okay, so here begins you and Phil Lewis, 15 years, I believe it is, together. I'm going to give the fast forward version. Um, you are the businessman. Everyone knows it. Anyone who booked LA Guns, anyone who worked with LA Guns knows that you kept it going. Everyone I spoke to who played in that band said, if it wasn't for Steve Riley, we'd be sitting at home. Um, Phil is the voice of LA Guns and all those things, and that's great. And it's great that he's there. But he is not a person who's going to go out and hustle. And that's not what he does. He's a performer. And you were booking vans and driving vans and and uh, and whatever it took, and it wasn't glamorous. And you are a little bit older than the other guys, and doesn't matter. You're hard. You're hustling. You were doing less of the press and things because you were always doing the business. When people would see LA Guns, the other guys would be meeting and greeting. You would be collecting. You know, this was that business. So it's going to go for a lot of years. And like I said, People say that Steve Riley is the one, Phil said it too, that keeps this band on the road. What I'm confused about, because now we're going to get into the modern day, is if Tracy Guns believes that you don't legally own the name, and he did say that, he sued you, um, why did you, the band, was it able to continue for 15 years? If he believed that your deal wasn't valid, he should have stopped it. Instead, he had an alternate LA Guns at that time, and most of them were very inferior, in my opinion. Delana, no disrespect to her as an artist, but having this female singer in LA Guns is a joke. It was really embarrassing. And Tracy was putting out these get in the van for very little money, silly shows. And I, I have my theories which is that he met somebody who told him uh, someone gets in your ear because it's not a lot of money and everyone knows suing each other is a big pain in the ass and the lawyers are usually the only ones who win. And so I think for those years he went, oh, screw it. I'll be my LA guns. They'll be their LA guns. That's right. All of a sudden he decides that your mark is not valid. He, he does have these theories that you've, you've stolen from him. This is something that he says that, um, that you stole royalties or something along those lines, right. and now he's going to sue you. Give me a little bit of your thoughts. You know, first of all, we were partners, and we were friends, both friends, and everything. Right up until we left to go do rides of destruction, that really hurt me. And uh, we were best friends, man, partners on everything, right across the board. And uh, yeah, when me and Phil continued on, he made no effort to stop us because he knew that we were partners in the name and, and pretty much everything. And uh, he made no effort for 15 years to stop us at all. The real effort from Tracy to stop me came when Phil just blew on me that he was going to get back with Tracy. And that in itself, Jason, is amazing because I've told it before, and I, 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 you know, me and Kelly Nichols talk about it. How can those two guys be together? right now because they do not like each other mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't care what anybody says i know what i know i was the only one constant factor in la guns through all the changes i know how they talked about each other i know how they got along while when they were together and they do not like each other mm -hmm. so when phil came to me saying I'm going to go and start doing some shows with Tracy. I was like, whoa, really? And uh, we were out on the road doing a bunch of dates, and uh, that, that just came out of nowhere. And I was like, wow. And so, you know, if that's what you want to do. But uh, he goes, yeah, you know, it's just going to be a few dates because he's out of his mind, Steve. I don't know how long it's going to last to do these dates. 
And I was like, why, why even do them? But anyways, he ended up doing them. And uh, then he came back and said, I'm going to be leaving and doing Tracy full time. And that was midway through, uh, what year was it? 2016. It was midway through that summer tour. So I had to go for six months knowing he was a lame duck. He was going to be splitting. This is another awkward thing you're about to describe that I also witnessed. I, I, I feel bad or semi-responsible that I reunited those guys. I ran into Tracy at the Hard Rock Hotel in Vegas. I said, I'm going to have Phil out as a special guest. Uh, uh, or No, I, I was going to have, I asked Tracy, you want to come out and be a guest? We're going to raise money for kids, Toys for Tots. It's a Christmas charity. He then link, hinted that he would like to have, he said no. The next day he called me and said he'd like to do it if Phil would do it. I said, why not? We'll get some press out of this. It'll be fun. Yeah. That'll be that. They hadn't seen each other in, in quite a while. When oh, yeah. they got together, they were introducing their new young girlfriends to each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, and they played some songs and the fans liked it. Didn't think anything would come of it. If it did, I thought maybe we'd be closer to having the real LA Guns back together. No, those guys get together. They make their decision to go on their own. Tracy has his issues with you. And yes, you guys are playing. I see you here in Las Vegas again. And now you're playing a show with Phil where you know that there's two shows left and he's leaving. And you've got to want to roll up the newspaper and hit him on the head. This, you know, this, this, no, it's got to be frustrating. Well, I just knew that he was making a bad call because to call that an LA Guns reunion with just the two of them, first of all, it's not a reunion. And then that is, second of all, to do it with him and know their past relationship, know how they torn each other up in the in interviews and all in the press and just said the worst things about each other. I just couldn't understand it. It, it wasn't registering to me. Why would you want to do this when you could, at this age, at this point in your career, don't you want to be comfortable and do it around people that you really did? So it wasn't really registering why you would want to do it. I guess they saw big dollar signs and, and that didn't happen. And no. so, no, it, it, it's not. It, the thing is, is that you've got to build a machine. I know that the machine that they have around them right now is not good. I know that they have some people working for them that probably don't know how to direct them, how to get the most out of what they are. And so uh, the thing is going to stall, and it has stalled, you know, not like I'm following it. Because I really haven't heard much of their music. It's not like I'm going on the internet. What are they doing now? I'm not like that. It's like I'm just thinking about what I'm doing right now, what, how I can help out what I'm doing. You but also I, didn't slam those guys. You yeah, refrained. Yeah, those Jason. Those guys talked a lot of shit, and you refrained from doing that. So you get they, – they screwed up something with the M3 festival. M3 wanted to put in – Another LA Guns, it seemed like it was a little bit of a screw you, we'll do this. I know that you were looking for different lineups, and I know a lot of people became into consideration. Jizzy Pearl and whoever else, there was a lot of ideas. Who knows, there's been a lot of members of LA Guns to choose from. <laughs> you had a whole Wikipedia to, to look at. And so Scotty Griffin was going to play bass, but Kelly Nichols comes on board. Scotty Griffin goes to guitar. He was a guitar player uh, before he was a bass player. Yes. And... Uh, um, Kelly comes in. I think fans are excited. Kelly was always kind of looked at as the cool one or the Izzy Stradlin of, uh, you know, of LA Gunzer. And so people like that. And so you get him back together and you guys uh, are looking for singers. I, you and I get in contact. I saw some of the people that you were looking at. I said, I got somebody for you. I and you somebody. nailed it. You nailed it, Jason. I want to go on the record as telling people because I've told it in some interviews, but I don't think people realize it that I was so fortunate when I was looking for singers, that could be such a long process of trying to find a good lead singer. And uh, when you, I, I was at the very beginning of that process when you told me to check out Kurt Froelich. And it, you nailed it. This guy is so good, so talented, such a great songwriter, fit right into what me and Kelly wanted to do. And uh, he was one of those guys, and you know many of them like I do, that are so talented that couldn't get something going for right. some reason or another. Something happened where they didn't get signed to the major deal, they didn't get into the major band, 
I know Kurt had done a little run with Faster with Brent Muscat, but I'm talking about the big record deal and, you know, in, in, in getting his career going. He's one of those talented guys that fell through the cracks and didn't get signed, and he should have been. But you're the man, bro. You told me to call him. I looked him up on the internet to see some stuff he had done on the internet. You told me, check him out, there's stuff up there. And um, I, I was blown away. I called him, and I said, do you want to do this and come out? Right then, it was only that M3 show. I, I had gotten the call in 2017 and 2018 from the promoters of M3, and specifically Eric Baker, yeah. who was one of the promoters for M3. And he's, he's a big manager too here in LA and a good friend. And he had asked me, do I want to do it and just put a band together? And I wasn't feeling it. I was like, ah, Eric, you know what? I don't really want to do that. I think it might come off cheesy. I don't know. I don't want to really go that route. And then I got the call in the 18 too, to see if I wanted to do it. When he called me in 2019 and said, the other guys with the Tracy people were going to do it, but they pulled out. I was like, really? Why would they pull out of this great festival bill? And uh, he told me they were really difficult to work with. They didn't like where they were ending up on the bill or some shit like that. And uh, he said, will you do it? He goes, people want to hear the LA Guns catalog. And you've, you've had a lot of members, and you can call some guys and see if you can put together a nice little band. And uh, I just thought about it, and I said, yeah, hey, man, screw it. Let's try it. Let's go have some fun. And I called uh, Juicy Pearl, and I called Stacy Blades, and uh, neither one of them wanted to do it. I don't think that they felt comfortable with Phil and Tracy being out there. Right. And I told them it was just a one-off. That's all it was at that point. Let's just go have fun at M3, see the other guys in the bands, and just hang and have a good time and play some of the old shit that all of us have played. And um, neither one of those guys wanted to do it. And like I said, I love both of those guys, but it was a blessing in disguise because I had to go into a different mo mode. I had I'd already accepted it from Eric and, uh, and the promoters over at M3. So I called Kelly and I said, you want to do this with me? And he was like, Riley, what took you so long? And I, I said, I know, bro. I love you. Let's, let's have fun. Let's go do this one-off show. And um, I go, Scotty Griffin, who's been playing bass with us, who Kelly had met, uh, I said, he's a terrific guitar player. Because when I was in the studio with Scotty, he had picked up the guitar and he had shown Stacy Blades some stuff. And I was like, wow, man, because, you know, he'd only played bass with us. I knew he was a guitar player. But in the studio is where I saw Scotty Griffin play. And I was like, wow, this guy is really, really good guitar player. And uh, I called Scotty up. And Scotty was going to be, he thought that he was not going to, I was going to do this show without him because he had heard Kelly was bad. And I said, Scotty, I want you to play lead. He goes, what? And I go, no, really, you know, that's what you do. You just play a bass to make money with us. And I understand it. I said, but you are a really good guitar player. Another great, really opportunity that I made happen. I don't know why. I just knew Scotty could do it. And I just jumped on it. So we had me, Scotty, and Kelly. And we were looking for a singer, which is when I started reaching out. And I talked to you, and I locked out. I locked out right away with Kurt. We didn't even audition another singer. It was Kurt Follett right from the start. So I thank you, my friend. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I thank you. Um, I, I wanted to point out that at the time I warned you, this is not going to be a Phil impersonator. That's not what I'm recommending to you. Uh, he's got the black hair. He's got the tattoos. He can sing and he can write songs. He is not going to go out and sing exact Phil Lewis uh, replica songs. He's a professional musician. He plays at Disney. He has a million cover bands. He's a working guy. Right. I had to tell him, you're probably going to be taking a pay cut to do LA Guns, you know, at the time, just one show, because he works constantly, you know, uh, corporate events, this and that. But like you said, he never got the opportunity he probably deserved. In Canada, he had a band called Loving Dead that had a little buzz, didn't cross over to America. And I think he's at a place in his life where he thought this is an opportunity for me to be seen and maybe it'll help my own music as well. 
Some fans um, don't like that he doesn't sound exactly like Phil. What I like about your band is that you're not trying to copy LA Guns. You're not an LA Guns cover band. Some people are mad that you play half of the new album Renegades at the show. Some people go, where are all the LA Guns songs? And I understand that too. But you're not going out there saying, we're LA Guns. This is a new product. Yes, you're going to get to hear the songs that you love. The reason you fought for to keep your brand all these years, of course you're going to use it. Why wouldn't you? You, if you, you, you wouldn't have kept it for those years. If you weren't going to use it, people will come see you because you have the brand, but you have new product. And Renegades is a departure. And I see a lot of people, and especially younger people and new people, who love it. I had Kurt on the show, and afterwards we sold a whole bunch of records. People were really digging that it's something different. Yes, it takes a minute, but you guys didn't just go, well, we're going to throw it out and go away. It's it very difficult during a pandemic. You guys put out different music. Maybe the other version of LA Guns or, you know, Phil and Tracy, maybe they're redoing some things that they've already done, in my opinion. Some riffs sound similar. Some, and sometimes you topics start to sound similar. It is what it is. But uh, so you, you guys get Kurt. You go out. You play these shows. And, um, and you put out a record that people seem to enjoy. The biggest commercial for your band, which is now called Riley's LA Guns, the biggest commercial ever is Phil and Tracy not knowing to shut up. And I don't say that to be disrespectful to those guys either, but they open their mouths and they tweet and they, they nobody gives a fuck. They talk too much and it upsets fans. Real fans don't want to be in bands drama. We just want to hear music. And I can tell you tons of fans who said, you know what? I like Phil and Tracy and I love LA Guns, but I don't want to hear it anymore. I'm going to let's listen to these other guys. I just want to hear music and have a good time and I don't want to hear about lawsuits. You know, obviously we're talking about it, but holy shit, music is supposed to be fun. And uh, and so you're doing your thing and now you get a lawsuit. Everyone gets a lawsuit. Everyone gets a cease and desist. And a and just to put it in the capsule, we, we did that uh, M3 show. When we did the M3 show, I reconnected with Eric Baker and I said, Eric, you know, me and Kelly want to really move on and try this thing out with Kurt and Scotty. It's a really good band. Kelly and I had co-written all the material in LA Guns in the early years. All five of us wrote that stuff together. That's why you see the credits as all five band members, because we all brought in our little thing to all of those songs. And so we co-wrote everything from Ballad of Jane to Never Enough to Rip and Tear, Sex Action, all of it. We co-wrote it all together. And uh, we have a right to play that. We really feel strongly about that, that we can play that for the rest of our lives. It's our material, as well as Mick, Kelly, I mean, Mick, uh, Phil, and Tracy. They also have the right to play that forever. I would never object to it. So when I hooked up with Eric Baker, I said, do you... Uh, we would need some direction, you know, and uh, he said, I'm with New Breed, Primary Wave, which is one of the biggest companies in the uh, in, in management and uh, in the publishing. And, and he has his own company, New Breed, that's in Primary Wave. And uh, I asked him, would you want to be interested in managing us? Me and you get along great. I would be the guy that, that is going back and forth to you and... Uh, we can make things happen and see if we can have fun with this. That was the main thing. If we were gonna do this, because believe me, you know, when I was out of LA Guns, after Flo and Trace got back together, those two years of 17 and, uh, and 2018, I had so much fun. I had not been off the road in whatever, 35 years or some stupid number. Mm -hmm. So I never had an opportunity to do other things. I got mixed up in doing this, uh, not mixed up, I got involved in doing this documentary and uh, this music for a horror movie and um, the, the director and producer from the horror movie asked me would I want to fly to New Orleans and have a part in the movie. And I had never acted before and I was like, absolutely. And you know, I went and read for it and he said, yes, we want you to do it. And I was like, okay, man. So these are things that I, and I flew to New Orleans and shot it 
it's called rightful and it's an independent release or whatever, it's going to get released. And whatever. But it was something that was different than what I had been doing for 40 years. And I, I was working on this documentary about the 90 singers that all died. There was about nine of them that all passed away. And I was putting this documentary together. I still have it really in final form. And at some point, I'm going to try to move it and see what happens with it. And I did this movie and placed a couple of songs in it. So I was having a blast, you know, just being off the road, catching my breath and not banging the drums constantly like I had been in Torrance. So when 19 started and, they, and this M3 thing, it escalated faster than I even had. I didn't think it was going to. It was going to be a one-off with M3 and that was it. Maybe a couple other fun shows in the summer. But not what happened with it, with Eric taking it over, taking us to Golden Robot Records, them wanting to sign it, knowing fully well that Phil and Tracy weren't involved, that it was me and Kelly, and uh, they wanted to sign it. They heard some of the material, and, the, and they wanted to do it with us. And so things escalated quickly. We then did M3. We did another show in Vegas, and then we were right in the studio. Boom. And uh, we finished the album. By the end of 2019, luckily, because right when 2020 broke, that was when the pandemic broke. So nobody was able to record. We were all done with our album. So during that whole 2020 year, when everybody had to sit around and be isolated, we had our album done. We were able to release a single every two months and have fun with it. And uh, and then the album eventually at the end of 2020, but I didn't have any grand plan. I bet. Yeah, I think people might think, wow, he was playing this out and thinking about what can he do, you know. And this happened so fast and so rapidly that it, it took me by surprise too because I wasn't even looking towards it, uh, towards doing something like this. But now I'm really happy I'm doing it and I'm so happy to be there with Kelly Nichols. I feel like I scored big with Kurt Folick and Scotty Griffin playing the guitar. I just yeah. feel like I, I scored big with putting a really good band together. I was fortunate and uh, had no idea that it was going to happen, but I'm so happy it did. And right now, you know, we did a bunch of great festivals this past summer. All the big festivals from Milwaukee Fest to M3 to Sturges. We did a bunch of really fun shows. And uh, uh, we, we're in right now pre-production, writing the second album, and it's going really well because we got four really great songwriters. So this is something I'm having fun with right now. And if for me to do it at this age, right. after this long, doing, I played with so many bands. I've recorded over like, Jesus Christ, 30 albums because I did a bunch of one-offs too with bands through the 70s and into the early 80s. I've recorded so many albums, and for me to do it right now, Jason, it's got to be fun. Sure. If it's a hassle or I'm dealing with somebody that is a hassle, I don't want to do that, man. I just don't have any time for that. But Kelly Scott and Kurt turned out to be really, really killer to work with. So let me ask you a couple more questions real quick, and then I'll let you go. Um, so Kelly Nichols was semi-retired. He was doing his own thing, at least for music. He... Uh, his stepdaughter was the actress Emma Roberts, uh, you know, famous actress, and he was ra raising her with his wife at the time, his wife at the time, and so he was out of it a little bit. And I think she's grown up; she's out of the house; she's back, you know, acting. And good, good timing for him to have some fun. Also, I'm sure it's the same thing for him. It's got to be fun. What about Mick Cripps? He lives in L.A. He plays in a band uh, with one of the guys from the Choir Boys, or I think, right? And, Yes. Any consideration of him doing it? Yeah, you know, Mick is such a good friend of me and Kelly's, and we've stayed close over the years. And uh, we called him right away and asked him if he wanted to do it with Scotty playing lead and playing rhythm. And uh, he just didn't want to do it, and we totally understood it, too. He was doing this band with the guys from the Quiet Boys and having fun moving around London and the, the pubs and playing small venues and just having fun. And I said, Nick, I totally get it. But I want you to know it would be great if you did it with me and Kelly. The door is always open. If you want to do this with the four of us, 
we will do it and we'll have fun with it and it won't be any kind of a, a hard thing to do. And so we left that with Nick that way. If you ever want to do it, you have got the door wide open. I'd love to see him jam, you know, at the very least in some time, come up in L.A. It seems like he doesn't want to tour from what I gather. It seems like that's not and, – and he wants to do his new thing. But it sure would be nice to see him play with, uh, with you and Kelly. So, okay, uh, you get this lawsuit. It, talking about lawsuits is exhausting. There's no real reason to get into it. I'm still confused why it took 15 years to decide they think you don't own the mark. I want people to understand in these kind of cases that – this is not something that goes to court. Judge Judy didn't hear this case. People go back and forth, and then you go, how do we just get out of this? Because who cares? It's not worth fighting about. You're going to go to a judge, and then you're going to – nobody wants to hear it. Everyone loses money. So you decide that you'll call it Riley's L.A. Guns. You still are able to use the shield. Um, so it's not a victory for either side. Everyone's going to claim a victory, but the truth is, it was the case was never heard. It was easier to do it this way. Of course, Phil and Tracy have the right to play L.A. Guns music and call themselves L.A. Guns. I don't think you dispute that or anyone else does. There is room for two bands. I think that the reason why um, you use the name, as I said, is because that's how, how people know. And there are members, original members of that band. There's two of you. There's two of them. Okay. I, I get it. So the band is called Riley's L.A. Guns now. It's nothing has changed other than you've added the Rileys to it. People can listen to Phil and Tracy. They can listen to you guys. Music is music. I get annoyed when I see the guys who are not the uh, members of the band. I call them scabs. When they start to fight on social media, they should shut up. They have nothing to do with it. If Phil is mad at you and Tracy and the three of you want to bicker and Kelly, fine. You were there. You paid the dues. You wrote the songs. It's your fight. But when you get these guys who are no better than Brent Muscat impersonators, it, it, it doesn't make sense. I don't get it. And uh, they should, everyone should just shut up and, and let the music do the talking. And uh, it's strange, though, because your settlement, I felt like it didn't have a bit of a gag order. I felt like everyone should have shut up afterwards. And that didn't happen. It, you know, I got to tell you, what a waste of time that was. It was just a waste of time in my life. It was something that... I had offered right up front to say LA Guns featuring Steve Riley and Kelly Nichols. We were going to do that and then um, obviously ended up being Riley's LA Guns because that's what they wanted. So the thing is, is that if you read the first complaint that they put up on the internet, which is insane, they put that whole lawsuit up on the internet so people could read it, which was crazy. And uh, I, if you look at that, all of the complaints in that, none of them, they didn't get any of that. They just got me needing to establish that this was Riley's LA Guns with Kelly Nichols and Scott Griffin and Kurt Fuller. But it was a waste of time. They, I'm so proud of me, Kelly, and the guys for not getting up on the internet, especially me and Kelly, because they trashed us on the internet. I mean, they said we couldn't play anymore, that we couldn't do, that we were not, not talented or that we had very little to do with the early LA Guns. Listen, man, we were the rhythm section on all of that material. We co-wrote it, but we were the driving engine behind all of the LA Guns material, Kelly Nichols and me. We were the, 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 the battery. We were the guys that played together on all of it, all of those hits in the early days. And like I said, co-wrote it. In fact, you know, I think it's well known that Kelly wrote Ballad of Jane, our biggest hit. He's the one that brought the gist of that song in. And when I say that we all co-wrote it, that's how we wrote material. Somebody would bring the gist of the song in and the band would finish it, which is why we wanted to share credit across the board. If there was money to be made, all of us would make money together. I would always think that's great. That's how we're doing it with uh, this new uh, outfit. Yeah. Yeah. Less drama, and then you don't get people bringing in bad ideas just because they want to try to make more money, um, so, which eventually yeah. happens. Everyone's doing it. I get uh, annoyed when they say that the new guys are better, than, and, and and I don't know these guys, but I'm just saying these guys are better than who. I don't give a fuck. It's it's ridiculous. Kelly Nichols is the guy. Steve Riley. These are the guys. I mean, it makes no. Don't tell me about these new people who you think are better. It, you thought they were. You thought that Kelly and Steve were good enough for all those years. You know, it, 
The arguments are silly. The arguments are petty. They, again, if people like their music, that's great. I think they lose fans every day by uh, uh, tweeting. These are grown men sitting uh, on the internet. Yeah, it's yeah, ridiculous. Yeah, that by talking like that, and I, I'm telling you, the fans are way smarter than they give credit for because they dial into that and they're saying, why are they talking so much shit and just over and over and over? And that's why I'm so proud that I, me and Kelly did not get up on the internet and start an internet answer war with them saying, no, that's not right. They're, they're assholes. No, I love all of the guys in the original LA guys. Just like I love all the original guys in, in Lost that I played with. I never understood somebody saying that they didn't like somebody and they played with them here for years. That just never made sense for me. So I will never say one bad thing about anybody that's been in LA Guns or anybody that I played with. I just don't think it goes over. I think the fans are smarter than we than some people give them credit, and they 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 totally got this one. They saw that me and Kelly were taking the high road. We weren't going to go down that road and and and, and sling mud like they were doing. We just let them kind of dig a little bit of hole for themselves and and kind of look foolish doing it in the in turn. And, uh, you know, I, I wish them all the luck in the world. They're, they're people that I did a lot of work with and had a lot of fun and toured all over the world many times. And me and Kelly don't have a bad thing to say about any of those guys. Yeah, and I should point out that you guys never misled the audience. Everything was advertised, said who's in the band. I've never seen a picture of you guys and didn't say who's playing. And so, uh, which, which is not always common, um, these days i'd much rather see the wasp reunion than the la guns reunion myself um so <laughs> i both sides very difficult but uh, i got my fingers crossed that that uh i'm hoping to have blackie lawless on he's going to promote i've ha I had johnny on uh, rod uh, I'm, I'm hoping to blackie will come on and promote this 40th anniversary and i will uh try my best to i tell you what jason to you know knowing that it's been 36 years since um, Last Command has been released. I have nothing but fond memories about that whole thing. Not only were the band on fire when we went into the studio, the album turned out great. I'm really proud of being on a couple of the biggest Wasp songs with Wild Child and Blind in Texas. I'm really proud of that and that I was involved with that. I listened to those songs on the bus when Blackie was playing them on an acoustic. And, uh, and so, you know, I'm proud of that. And I, I, have, I have nothing but pride about that album and the tour that we did for The Last Command too. That whole period was just a really rich period for LA music and for us in particular. And I just had a blast doing it. I was just, uh, I thought that band was great. And I thought Last Command turned out amazing. I love that album. It's funny that you see Wild Child is like never enough. It's huge. It's it just keeps it keeps getting pop more and more popular. Like when it came out, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's a great song. When it came out, it was popular, but it it survives. It just keeps surviving, and it keeps playing Absolutely. retro channels and shows. And so, uh, you've got a great body of work. I appreciate it. We spent uh, almost ninety minutes talking about it, and I'm really glad you could join me. And uh, people can check out Riley's LA Guns. I'll have a link to the website. And you can check out Renegades. And again, as Steve said, new music will be on the way as well. Let's hope that 2022, we have a little more normalcy and uh, everyone can go out there and do their thing. Jason, thanks so much, brother. And again, I want to thank you for introducing me to Kurt Follett. You are the man, man. I didn't have to go through any process of looking for a lead singer. You, you nailed it when you asked, asked me to check him out. And uh, you're a good guy and you're a good friend. I wish you nothing but the best, bro. Thank you so much, Steve. You take care. All right, thanks.